she's now in another country, uh, do they lose the same subpoena power? As if, it's uh, very, very, very difficult to, to enforce that. Very difficult. Nothing in life is impossible, but that would be almost impossible. If he went to Europe and didn't want to testify, I think um, it would be very hard for anybody to get him to, to cooperate. Very, very hard, you know? Absolutely. Okay, I think we have another caller here from Oklahoma. 580 is the area code. Please state your name and where you're calling from. You're live with Tom Mesero. 580, it's your turn. And uh, you're live with Tom Mesero. Hi, my name is Rita. I'm calling from Ada, Oklahoma. I'm a really, Hi, um, I really respect uh, you, Tom, and I have endless uh, thanks for all that you have done and still do for Michael Jackson. Well, thank you so much. You're very kind with your words, and uh, uh, I appreciate them very much. Thanks for calling. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if my question might have been asked prior, so you can let me know once I ask it, but concerning estate law with Michael Jackson's estate, um, when executors go against the express wishes of the decedent, in this case selling of his his half of the Sony ATV catalog, uh, how are the executors held accountable for that? Is there any recourse on that, especially when the sale price is suspiciously close to an IRS bill for the same amount of $750 million? Um, th- that's basically my question. Well, I don't practice estate law. It's not my specialty. Um, I know that uh, that the the executors, uh, the trustees, um, are held accountable. Uh, there is a judge in probate court that I believe um, at some point has to review and possibly approve what expenditures and what financial decisions are made. Um, you know, uh, I don't know the circumstances under which this price was negotiated. Um, uh, I know that Michael, the Michael Jackson I knew would have been horrified to see the, the catalog sold, but you know they're in they're in charge now and they're in charge with preserving these assets, uh, doing their best to help these assets to appreciate. And I don't know really what considerations they uh, went into this because I'm not part of it. It's not my specialty. I wasn't involved in these decisions, uh, and I don't know. Uh, I don't examine the estate's accounting. Uh, so I can't tell you um, what was right or what was wrong. I can tell you that the Michael Jackson I knew would have been probably appalled that uh, his interest in the catalog was completely sold. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay. Concerning Neverland, um, his beautiful place where he lived almost uh, 20 years, and you advised him kind of like in a warning way that as long as Tom Snedden was around that he would never rest until he would try to pin something else on Michael. And uh, you advised him to leave. Was yeah. there any sense that uh, he was leaving this this beautiful property that is still so saturated with his spirit uh, that he was thinking that one day his children could come back there you know, I don't know how to answer that. Um, when I suggested that he get away from Neverland, that it had run its course, that nothing is forever, and that he'll never live in peace there, uh, there was a little bit of resistance. He had uh, Grace, his nanny, call me to find out if I had more any any information that I hadn't shared that uh, that that uh, that bolstered what my feelings. And I said I don't really have any special information. I've lived here for six months. I've seen the way these prosecutors and these sheriffs um, and their investigators uh, treated Michael Jackson. I know how humiliated they were by the total defeat. Uh, They've been embarrassed. They run the show up here. And um, I just had a very deep, intuitive feeling that they would try to look to pin a case on him. And Randall Sullivan, who wrote the book Untouchable, confirmed that I was correct. Uh, mm-hmm. He claims that Snedden was trying to put together a prescription drug case to go after Michael Jackson with, and that uh, he was 
dissuaded from doing that because Michael had left the country and was living abroad. Mm-hmm. But I really felt that they would look for any opportunity to come after him again, that they were so devastated and embarrassed by the worldwide attention to their defeat that uh, they'd never let him live in peace, that if a child wandered onto the grounds, they'd get some, you know, employee, jealous employee who wants to sell a story to, to testify against him. I, was, I had a very, very bad feeling about what could happen if he stayed there, and I still think I was 100% correct. But as far as leaving it for his children, I never discussed it with him. Um, I know that uh, Catherine, at one point, was hoping that uh, the estate would keep it for his children. Now, her views may have changed. I just don't know. Right. I I just kind of suspect that when she passes on, that the children will remember that as the only house that they really had as a home with their father and that the sentimental value outweighs anything of monetary value. Well, this this criminal case destroyed so much that was good. You have to understand that. That Neverland could never be the same place after this horrible case. It just couldn't be. Right. You know, uh, he he had constructed Neverland with all of his creative genius and sensitivity and, and sense of humanity. He made it a, a one of the most magnificent homes in the world. I mean, and I was there at night when no one else was around, and he had selectively, you know, placed little lights on different trees and bushes to create a Disney-like effect, and he would play Disney-like music. And so you'd be hearing this music as you looked at this gorgeous sky and moon and stars, and you'd see these lights twinkling everywhere and you know you thought you were in uh in heaven i mean it was you know <laughs> such a magnificently beautiful place and the animals and the uh the scenery and just uh he placed little statues in select parts of neverland he he selected lighting in a special way i mean everything about it was so unique uh and just uh i can't tell you uh, just the feeling it was just an amazing feeling but it all got crushed and shattered in this 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 case. I mean, they you know, seventy sheriffs initially descended on Neverland and tore the place up. You know, his bedroom was a complete mess. You know, the and mm-hmm. the allegations of molestation are so ugly. I mean, in many ways, to accuse someone of being a child molester is worse than being accused of being a murderer in American society. So, they, so much was done to destroy what was created and what existed there. And and I felt you could never return to those pristine, pure moments that, uh, that he loved so much. It wasn't going to happen again. Mm-hmm. Do his children have recourse on this to, to state what their intentions are? You know, I believe they do. They're represented by lawyers. I think, uh, the lawyers have a right to object, but ultimately, you know, the trustee and the executors have tremendous authority to make financial decisions. You know, they have to be prudent, but I mean, you know, what's prudent is very much a, a subjective, you know, discussion. I think I think Mr. Branca issued a statement saying that the seven hundred and fifty million would uh, would just make sure the children were, you know, secure the rest of their life and. You know, uh, again, I, I'm not the authority on this. I didn't participate in this. It's not my specialty. And I can't really criticize a decision I don't know much about except to say that on an emotional, intuitive level, I think Michael would have been appalled. Yes. Well, thank you very much, and I wish you well. And I uh, always, uh, like I said, hold you in high esteem and thank you so much for being so tireless when it comes to being asked these questions for Michael. I realize you don't have to do this, so um, best wishes to you, Tom. Thank you very much, and same to you. appreciate your remarks. Okay, we have one last question that came in, Tom. I, I don't know if you can answer this or not. Um, what can you tell us about, if you can at all, the last years of Mr. Sletton's life after the trial, what did he do after he retired in 2006? Uh, do you know any of that knowledge? The only information I got, and it was very little, was that he played a lot of golf. You know, he had a lot of friends and supporters in Santa Barbara. 
but I was told by someone whose name I won't reveal who was close to him that probably at best there was a profound sense of sadness about him for losing the Michael Jackson trial. And that's really all I know. That's all I know. He had a lot of supporters there, you know, up until the time he died, and I'm sure still. You know, many people thought he was a very good father. Uh, He coached disabled kids. Many people thought he had a good heart in many ways. A lot of people liked him. Uh, He was a district attorney for a long time. Um, I wish he had not been obsessed with taking down Michael the way he was. Um, But I was told again that uh, the best way this person could describe the way he was was there was a profound sense of sadness about him over what happened in the Michael Jackson trial. Do you think that aggravation not uh, caused his death, but maybe uh, initiated it and maybe uh, helped it? I just don't know. I mean, I really, I really didn't know Mr. Snedden well enough or his family well enough. Um, I just don't know how to answer that. I, I have no idea. And you always said um, the other trial lawyer, uh, well, the uh, the the, the uh, prosecute the prosecutor uh, uh, Ron, that was a long Ron Jonan was a uh, one a one a. A uh, great prosecutor. He was, he was a he was a very talented, very passionate, very prepared, and very aggressive trial lawyer. I never faced a better one than him. He was the best prosecutor on the team. He was clearly better than Snedden and Auchincloss. They had their own strengths as well. Don't get me wrong, but Zonin was a complete package. He was really really good. Uh, he really seemed to believe in what he was doing, and he was formidable. He was a very strong cross examiner. Um, and highly respected in that uh, that county. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, he, he certainly was. Do you have uh, uh, Do you have time for one last call? I'll take one last call, and I do have to leave. I apologize. Okay, this is the final call, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go up to nine one two is the area code. Please state your name and where you're calling from. Uh, let me just get that. Not. Give me one second here. Uh, okay, nine one two. You're live. Um, hi, my name is Mel. I'm calling from Georgia. Hi. Hi, Miss Mesro. Hi, Jordan. Hi. Hi. Um, since you guys were talking about um, Tom Smith, I just had um one quick question. Um. I know you've mentioned that Snedden had flown to um, Australia and Canada in the mid nineties. Um, there, there's an episode of hard copy with, um, you know, the age old Michael Jackson detractor, Diane Diamond, where she had flown to Canada because apparently she thought she was going to break the next big Michael Jackson story. Then it turned out to be a, a bust. Was that the situation that Thompson had flown to Canada about? Because I know in the, um, in the segment there, it mentioned that authorities in California had been alerted to this boy's allegation. Do you know if it, well, was, if, if it was for that situation? My understanding, was that he went, my understanding was that Snedden went to a number of countries, including Australia and Canada, uh, that he had a website at the Sheriff's Department in Santa Barbara County basically advertising, you know, if you know anything about Michael Jackson's activities with children come forward. There was only, we called it a casting call, you know, for people uh, who would have wanted to testify against Michael Jackson. Um, I don't know if he went to other countries. I know he and Diamond were reportedly very close. In fact, I was told, um, Pi, if this is correct, but I was told that Diamond was promised that she would be the number one journalist reporter outside the jail getting information from the sheriffs when Michael Jackson was convicted and hauled off to jail, that this was going to be a big, you know, big event for her in her career. Remember, she reportedly was the only journalist invited to the raid on Neverland in November of 2004, I guess it was, or 2003, excuse me, 2003. She was reportedly the only journalist invited for that first raid on Neverland. And, uh, again, apparently she really expected to, you know, just 